Dr. Mo Ibrahim, our guest of honor, excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth anniversary public lecture by Dr. Mo Ibrahim and of course the sixth anniversary celebrations of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, we look forward to having a lovely evening uh, tonight, but to have a lovely evening, you have to have a sponsor. And please let me begin at the very outset by thanking Mr. Lim Chi Kiat and Mr. David Chong for having spontaneously, and I actually mean this, spontaneously offering to support uh, the celebrations tonight. Uh, they're not here with us, but I'm glad to see Ambassador Hogim, General Winston Chu, and Mr. Lim Chi Kian here. Please join me in thanking them for their support. Uh, one of my gurus, Ambassador Tomiko, was supposed to be here. I, I, I see that he's not here. But as you all know, I learned from Ambassador Tomiko that when you speak, you should always make three points. <laughs> so I'll make uh, three points. The first point is, of course, about the fact that we really have a lot to celebrate at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Now, some of you were there last year uh, when we had our fifth anniversary celebrations with uh, MM, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as our guest of honor. I gave a fairly comprehensive account of what we achieved in the first five years. So I'll not repeat what I said then, but I think I just want to, uh, do, just to highlight how amazingly this school is doing, let me just mention three significant developments or achievements for the school just in the last year alone. Uh, first is, of course, the double degree that we sign with the University of Tokyo. Now, so why is this double degree with University of Tokyo a major achievement? Well, we discovered when we were negotiating the double degree with the University of Tokyo, that it was founded in 1877. And for 132 years, they did not sign a single double degree with any university anywhere in the world. And the first ever that the University of Tokyo signed was with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And believe me, that was a great compliment to us. The second development worth mentioning is the fact that we launched uh, early this year, together with the NUS Business School, the, a Master's in Public Administration and Management in Chinese. And for us, believe me, it was truly a great honor when this program was actually launched by Minister Li Yuan Chao one of the most senior ministers in the Chinese government, in fact, the Chinese minister who's responsible for developing and grooming talent in the Chinese Communist Party. And he's, his job is to nurture the future generation of leaders of China, and guess where he came to launch the first overseas program at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And the third development that is also worth mentioning is the fact that since last year, as you know, we run a lot of uh, executive education programs, short-term programs, and I want to mention in particular the kind of visionary support we're getting from one corporation, Wilmar Corporation, which has been very generous in its support of our executive education programs because Wilmar actually believes that good governance is good for business. And this is, of course, a hint to all of you, the businessmen in this room, we hope you'll join Wilma in doing the same. <laughs> now, since I mentioned good governance, this brings me to the subject of the lecture, which of course is good governance. And here I want to say that the biggest lesson we have had from the financial crisis of the past year or two is that governance is back. I don't know how many of you may remember this, but there was a time when governance was out of fashion Remember when Ronald Reagan said very famously, he said, government is not, government is the problem. Government is not the solution, right? And guess what? 
The Western countries adopted their ideology, they believe the markets know best, and they went through a lot of grief. So the big lesson we've learned from the financial crisis is that you need to have the invisible hand of free markets and the visible hand of good governance, and that's how you develop uh, in, a, in a stable fashion. And as I was telling our guest of honor, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, in some ways, the Asian development experience is probably far more relevant to Africa and its development because we have recently gone through many of the struggles that African countries are going through. And this is why, frankly, it is so appropriate to have Dr. Mo Ibrahim here, who has done more than anyone else to promote good governance in Africa to address the subject of good governance. And this brings me, of course, to my last point, which is to introduce the guest of honor, who in this case, I must say, literally needs no introduction and has had a remarkable career. And it was more, it was, I must say, I, I learned some remarkable facts even as I was walking here together with Dr. Mo Ibrahim. He told me he started off as an academic, writing, story, writing uh, articles about cellular communications and so on and so forth. And he described how he joined British Telecom, helped to design uh, the, the telecom network in UK. And he said that he set up his first company for 50,000 pounds or dollars, pounds, and sold it for 900 million dollars. Now, can you all eat your heart out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that, of course, his success did not stop there. He went on, he set up Celtel, which became uh, incredibly uh, successful, and as you know, uh, he, be he became so successful that he was then able to step down as chairman of Celtel and concentrate on establishing and building up the Mo Ibrahim uh, Foundation. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about the Mo Ibrahim Foundation because we'll have the pleasure immediately after this of watching a video, but I can tell you that Dr. Mo Ibrahim and his foundation have already had a major impact uh, in Africa. His foundation has already given out uh, the Mo Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership, with the first recipient being former President being Joachim Chisano of Mozambique, and the second being President uh, Festus from uh, Botswana. Um, and the, as a result of his work, he was named in 2008 as being the one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine. So you can see that we have a truly distinguished speaker here today who will address us uh, on the subject of good governance. But before you come to the stage, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, it gives me great pleasure now to let you know that we will first begin with a brief video. And I, and I hope you'll enjoy this evening to, today. Thank you very much. Nothing is as important as ensuring the quality of governance and good leadership in Africa. An African leader is faced with major challenges. How to take his people out of poverty, how to deal with issues of educating many young people, sorting out conflicts, dealing with health issues, water, electricity, their success is crucial. It's crucial for the lives of millions of people in Africa. We need a leadership that will create a bond between those who lead and the people who have given their trust in elections. Leadership is important everywhere, but especially so in Africa. The tasks facing leaders in Africa are challenging. In the lives and well-beings, many millions of people depend upon the performance of those leaders. It follows that we should strive to recognize and reward those successful leaders who are able to deliver tangible results for their citizens. Our African continent is rich in the diversity of its people. It is rich in its resources and it is rich in its potential. 
our continent is beginning to fulfill this promise. I am Mo Ibrahim. I'm a Nubian from Sudan, so I'm an African. I'm a businessman who was involved in uh, building telecom infrastructure in Africa through Celtel, uh, which is a success story. I think we prove the point that people can do clean business in Africa, help create jobs, create prosperity, build infrastructure, and uh, also can be profitable. Good governance and democracy are central to Africa's development. Without them, it will be hard, if not impossible, for any African countries to reach the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. That is why the mission of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation is so important. Thanks to Mo's vision, the Foundation can contribute to the growing movement to build honest and enlightened African leadership. Mo Ibrahim has established the Mo Ibrahim Foundation to develop criteria for good governance, stimulate a public debate, and challenge the continent's leaders to set at the global benchmark on this issue. We really want to support the African leadership and we want to reward achievement. We want to celebrate success of African leadership. We are going to offer the largest prize in history, the largest prize in the world for those successful leaders who manage really to take these people forward. Nothing is more important than that. And the important thing here is that we are African, and uh, this is an African foundation, it is an African money. This is Africa doing its own business. And it's time for us to really look back into Africa and do something ourselves. We cannot just sit there and expect the world to come and do things for us. And uh, so it is in that context we are launching really our foundation. It's wonderful that somebody of the caliber of Mo Ibrahim a successful businessman, feels so strongly about Africa and about leadership in Africa. I wish the Foundation much success in its important work. And I thank Mo Ibrahim for the leadership that he is demonstrating, the prize for which will be one we can all share, a better and brighter future. May your initiative inspire and celebrate the best of African leadership and equip future leaders with the knowledge and experience they will need. It is now our honor to invite Dr. Mo Ibrahim to address us. Dr. Ibrahim, please. Uh, your honors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm really delighted and honored uh, to come and speak in uh, this lovely city state. Uh, which showed us what good governance can do to its people. And uh, of all the places uh, uh, and all institutions, to speak really at the University of Lee Kuan Yew uh, School actually is a great honor. So thank you, Kishu, for inviting me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. That was the launch video. Uh, we, we, when we started uh, our work. Why, why, why we needed to launch uh, 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 the foundation? I'm not a do-gooder. I'm not, uh, I don't belong to the philanthropist or the Oxfam kind of sort of community. I'm an, an engineer who became a businessman. And uh, after I finished my business, uh, I looked around and I decided 
what shall I do now? And I want to do something naturally for, for my people. And uh, we made a lot of money in Africa. Celtel was a great success story. We sold it for $3.4 billion, which was the largest uh, sale in Africa. Actually, it is resold again now for $10 billion uh, to our elder friend. <laughs> and uh, really, uh, I believe this money really belonged to the African people, and I, I wanted to return this money back. But I wanted to return it back uh, again uh, in a sensible and most effective way. And uh, we decided really uh, the most effective way is to try to end poverty. It's not, it's not by filling plain loads with, with, you know, with, with, with wheat and blankets and take it for people. That deal was an issue today, but what about tomorrow? What about the day after? We need to go to the root of the problem. And it is obvious to me and obvious to, to many people that really the root of the problem is governance. Why African people are poor? That is a very interesting question. You are all aware probably that Africa is the second largest continent in Earth. It's huge, absolutely huge. We have probably 40 or 50 percent of the whole world resources. Yet, Africa supports only 950 million people. That's two thirds of India, 80 percent of China. We are not many Africans around. There are very few. And uh, so, why, why are we poor? We have everything we need. We have land, we have resources, we have water, we have cattle, we have everything. Why are we poor people? When you look into this, there's no other answer. It's a failure of leadership. It is bad governance. We let ourselves down. And we have to deal with that issue. It's not by aid, it's not by good wishes, it's not by Christmas, uh, Christmas parcels sent to people or all this stuff. This is the aspirins. Aspirins doesn't treat cancer. So we really need to go to the root of the problem and we see why are we uh, 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 really hungry. When we have all this land, 60 or 70 percent of the world land really useful for agriculture, uh, cultivable land, Arable land is, is in Africa. It's not used. It's uncultivated. 60 or 70 percent of uncultivated land, arable land, is in Africa. Why? When we have food deficit. So the answer was is the leadership and, uh, uh, and, and, and governance. We need to go to the root uh, of the problem. Uh, so that's, that was the, really the reason we wanted to do this. To deal with governance issue is a little bit tricky, of course, in Africa or anywhere, because it touches on sovereignty. It touches uh, on a lot of, of, of important issues. So the only way to handle this was through an African foundation using African money run by African people. And that is the only way for us to be able to work in that critical and sensitive area. So our foundation doesn't take money from anybody. We're closed because we don't want to give a chance to anybody to say you are stooges of the, you know, spies of the British or agents of the American or we don't want any of that stuff. And it's run by uh, our people. 50% of them, people in our board, our vice committee, are women. Because we'll have to show also the, the, the basis of good governance. And uh, that, that is uh, uh, essential for us. We had, no doubt, a tragic history in Africa. We suffered from slavery. We had colonialism. And probably much worse than colonialism and little has been said about it 
the Cold War. The Cold War was one of the worst areas, uh, really, or, 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 or periods which we have experienced in Africa. When the two superpowers were vying for strategic positions and strategic resources, and they did all what is needed to secure these resources. So, uh, terrible dictators were supported, thieves were supported, armed, and supported. And Africa sank, sank into a mountain of debt, money given to corrupt dictators, and which later on the African people were supposed to pay back. And the African people have been paying back for the last, last 50 years until at last we managed to cancel some of this debt. There's nothing worse than the famous words when the World Bank, and we have here Vice President from the World Bank, she can contest me if, 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 it's, not, if it's not true, kept boring money into the pockets of Mobutu in Congo, which was all stolen. And the World Bank continued to do it, debt for the Congolese people. And then came a time when even the World Bank said, no, I cannot give any more. And then the famous exchange between the American ambassador and the World Bank representative, when he went to him and said, how dare you not give cancel the debt for Mobutu? The World Bank man said, because he is a bastard. And the American ambassador's reply was, but he's our bastard. <laughs> so thanks to the American ambassador, thanks to the World Bank, Africa sank into massive amount of debt, which didn't go for the African people, didn't go for development. It ended up in Belgium and fabulous houses in south of France, etc. That was a cold war for us. Thanks God that was ended. And it's very interesting to see that since 1990, the growth rate in Africa. Africa averaged a growth rate of 2.5% through the 90. Through the first decade, our growth rate is around 5.5% per year, the highest in the world, it's a sustained, it's a sustained uh, rate of growth, maybe next only to China or so. Why is that? I think the end of the Cold War was an important area where people now are being held accountable, no longer an American ambassador or a British ambassador or Singaporean ambassador can talk about our bastards. <laughs> There's no place for bastards in New Africa. And that is important. Uh, but what's also important is the rise of the civil society. And our foundation objective was then to really harness that civil society to, held, to hold governments accountable for people. We need to have a serious conversation between the people and the government about the issue of governance. That is the most important issue facing us. And we thought, let us start to define what is governance. And in our view, governance is a basket of political goods governments are responsible for delivering to its citizens. Then we went a step further and we said, can we measure it? Can we quantify it? And out of that was born our index for governance. What we're doing with the index is that we measure the performance of every single African government. Currently, we measure some 85 parameters. Uh, we produce an annual index. Actually, this year, the index will come in a month or two uh, for uh, 2010. We expect to measure over 100 parameters. What do we measure? We measure what we consider the balance of governance. First is the economy. What exactly is happening in the economy? From how many kilometers of roads have been paved? How many telephone lines? Power generation? 
water, how many people will have access to it? all the artery of commerce and industry, which the government need to provide or to facilitate the private se sector to provide. We don't care who provides the service, but it need to must be provided for people. So we talked about economy, we talk about human development. By human development, we measure health, education, etc. access to health and education for everybody, not for the urban uh, dwellers only, but for everybody in the country. We measure things like how long girls stay in schools, for example, which are proxy for gender issues. Uh, then we measure rule of law. We, we measure transparency, we measure, so it is, it is all these things, safety, how many violent deaths, are, is it safe to walk in the streets? How many cases of rape? How, so there is so many parameters, institution building. We don't think democracy is about going to a ballot box once every four years. We think democracy is much more than that. Yes, it's about that, but also about the freedom of people for association, to express their views, regional democracy at the local level, at this and that, is citizens of the country being, being able to exercise their free rights and free will anywhere without fear. How many journalists are in prison? We check that. How many, so that's what we do with the index of governance. And to do that, we have the full cooperation of the World Bank of the United Nations, Transpar well, there's like 40, 50 organizations worldwide which feed us all the raw data, which we scrub, and we have about 40 or 50 African academics really dedicated to work on, on sorting out this data and producing uh, the index every year. That will be an accurate, as accurate as possible measure of good governance. Then we publish that in all African language, in every country of the 53 countries, in the local language. We take whole pages in the newspapers, we publish the results of that country and the neighboring country, etc. And it's up to citizens of that country to really discuss the performance or lack of it of the government. It's up to them to have that conversation. But we want that conversation to be objective. You know, speech writers, I hate speech writers. We want to put those guys out of job. We want, really, we need to have an honest discussion based on facts and numbers. What did you deliver? We don't want to hear flowery speeches. We want our presidents to come and tell us exactly what they did. This is, is a scorecard uh, for everybody. Uh, besides the index, of course, we have the bribes also, because on the other hand, we need to recognize those leaders who come and face massive challenge, massive challenges they are facing. Uh, if you are running the typical European countries, you know, I ask some people, and you say, oh, we don't what, what, when you go to sleep, what do you worry about? Inflation will going to be 1.5% or 1.75%. Hip replacement queues will be six weeks or seven weeks. Uh, what, what exactly things you keep you from sleeping if you are a leader in European countries? Football maybe? I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you look at an African leader. If half your population don't have power, if half your population don't have clean water, you have half a million kids coming to school age, you don't have school places for them. You have problems with roads, you have problems with malaria, you have problems with AIDS, you have, how do these guys go to sleep at night? That is a major challenge those people are facing. At the same time, what support are they getting? Where are the think tanks? Where are the intellectuals? Where are the really vibrant media and press which can really offer ideas, support, etc.? Is not around. 
is a very lowly job and a very tough job. So, if a leader faced with all this can come through, take the country forward, transform it, that is a hero. That is wonderful. And we need it to reward and recognize uh, those people. We want them to come and work with us in civil society after they leave office. That's why we started uh, uh, our award. Let me ask you a question. I hope you are not offended. How many of you heard of Shisano? Can you please raise your, raise your hands if you heard of Shisano? Well, about seven people, half of them Africans. How many people heard of Mokhai? Okay, even less. How many people heard of Mugabe? <laughs> I think I bet my case. <laughs> President Shisano is the winner of our prize three years ago, the first prize, and he came to power in Mozambique. Mozambique is a country in Africa. <laughs> Some people think Africa is a country, so I have to be careful. Uh, there was a very vicious civil war going on. Very vicious civil war. You recall, I don't know, some of you maybe remember, there was this nasty uh, group called RENAMO, supported by the racist regime in South Africa, which was waging very terrible war. What Shisano did was something amazing. This man went to the leader of RENAMO and said, I really hate your guts. You are a criminal. You are a killer. But for the sake of my country, I extend my hand for you. Please come and fight me through the ballot box. If you have a case, put it to the people and win the election. We guarantee your safety, we guarantee your democratic rights. What a wonderful act of leadership to end a very vicious war which devastated the countryside of Mozambique. And suddenly, Mozambique became a democracy. And suddenly, they transformed the economy into a liberal economy, they built institutions. That is a wonderful act of transformation. Imagine if President Bashir did this to our brothers in the south of Sudan or to our brothers and sisters in Darfur. How many hundreds of thousands of lives would have been saved? How much destruction would have been saved? This is the crucial acts which leaders, real leaders, come and exercise at a crucial moment and change the destiny of, of their country. These are the heroes we're looking for. In Botswana, President Mukhai, third president of, of Botswana, is a very small country, was a very poor country, a very high percentage of HIV positive uh, population, and how they, they really transformed Botswana, the first country in Africa to really turn resources from a curse to a blessing, because they showed the way how the country natural resources can be used for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of the country, not to enrich the president or his clan or his tribe or his family. How people have transparency, how to install good governance, and suddenly Botswana changed. Botswana is no longer a poor country. Botswana now is a middle income country. Total transformation. And yet, you, very informed and educated people here, you are the cream of Singapore, you don't know who Mukhai is, but you are all aware of our villain. So we think it's important to really celebrate our unsung heroes, because we have heroes. You only know Mandela, but Mandela is one 
of a number of years we have. And we think it's important for us to really get those here out, heroes out, introduce them to the world. So these are the real Africans. Forget about Mugabe, please. <laughs> and uh, thank you. We had our first celebration of uh, African leadership, uh, the prize ceremony. Where we had that in Alexandria, in the Bibliotheque of Alexandria. I don't know if you heard about the Bibliotheque of Alexandria. Why we had it in Alexandria? Because 2,400 years ago, in Alexandria, Africa had the only library in the world the only unformist library in history we had in Africa. It's not, not in Europe. I'm sorry, not in Singapore. <laughs> you didn't know how to read or write by that time, I'm sorry. But we had it in Africa. And just and, and in that library, we had the philosophers, the mathematicians from all over the world, not only from Africa, working there. And that's where... Uh, you know, a few inventions, you know, analytical uh, uh, analysis, uh, uh, geometry, etc., were invented in, in Alexandria. Just outside the library, there was Alpharus. Alpharus was one of the wonders, I would say, seven wonders of the old world. It was 150 meters lighthouse. 150 meters lighthouse, sending light 100 kilometers towards Europe. So we, the dark continent, were sending light to Europe 2,400 years ago. That's why intentionally our first meeting, our first celebration was in Bibliotheque. She was asked to tell Africans that that's our history. That's where we come from. Uh, we, this is a message in self-confidence. And we were not always backward. That's really uh, uh, important for us. Now, we moved in as a foundation now to, we, we, we work closely with the African, uh, key African institutions, which is the African Development Bank and the African Union and uh, the Economic Commission for Africa, the UN arm in Africa, and of course with our friends in the uh, World Bank, and uh, to develop really our agenda in Africa. And we are all focusing now in really what we call the African agenda. We need to know exactly what is needed now to do. Everybody now accepted governance is essential, and we insisting on that everywhere. So that is gone, and we continue to, to work on it. Now, what would you want to tell that into a policy? And let me tell you the three items we have uh, there. Number one is the African integration, African economic integration. It is essential. One of the problems we inherited is that each African countries, each of our countries were connected to what you called the mother country, the colonial power. So you want to fly out from Lagos? Of course you fly very easy to London, but it's not easy to go somewhere else. Yeah, if you are in Cote d'Ivoire, you fly to Paris. So our routes are always, our telephone networks are all connected along the line. I was telling Kishu about our experience with Brazil and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Congo Brazzaville and Congo Kinshasa, two great cities, one in DRC, one in Congo, separated by the river Congo, facing each other. You can see each other across the river. Yet, a phone call from one capital to another will have to go to Brussels, then Paris, then come back, and cost nine dollars. <laughs> Why? Because one country was occupied by France, one country was occupied by Belgium, and that is the only links they have. Crazy, unsustainable. And this, 
all the routes, all the roads of Africa was built towards the sea. Is not built between African countries, no. It's just what you do, you take the board, you send to the mother country, the colonial power. That doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Inter-African trade is 9% of total African trade. This is not sustainable. It doesn't work. And actually, I, I always joke with my friends because you have some countries, quite few countries in Africa, which are landlocked. And wonder what happens to it, how they send physically their trade, avoiding other African countries. So it said that they must beam or cut off by satellite or somehow to avoid really going to neighboring countries. How can you do 9% trade if you are a landlocked country? Strange. So we really must work towards the freedom of movement of people, capital, and goods across the borders. Otherwise, some of our countries would not be viable. I always ask the question, Germany, the German economy is much bigger than the total African economies. And so is the British economy or the French economy. Why those guys have to create the European Union? Why they have to break? They needed that economy. They're not stupid. They actually hate each other. They killed each other. I mean, let's count how many people killed in the last century by those. This was the killing machines, actually, these European states. Really, not in the human history, so many people were killed. Think of the First World War, Second World War, in between, etc. So they don't like each other, but they're smart. That's why they have the European Union. Why are we, Africans, have 53 countries with 53 custom laws, barriers, etc., etc., etc.? It doesn't work. That must be broken. So that is the first item on the agenda for the African Union, for the African Development, for our foundation, for civil society, for everybody. That's what we are blessing the World Bank, that all the development money should go towards integration. We need to generate power, we need to do water, we need to do, we must do it across the continent. We become partners in development. Then the second one is agriculture. It's very important for us. 70% of our people are working in agriculture and the land. Yet we are not feeding ourselves. There is a food gap because it's inefficient, lacks investment, seeds, etc., etc., etc. And we need to really focus in that area. There is no investment really have gone in, into one issue we are holding with the African presidents who are putting a lot of pressure now on them is that in Mobutu in 2003, the African heads of the state agreed to allocate 10% of their funds to agriculture in each country. It's not much. When 70% of your people are in agriculture, it's not much to say I assign 10% to agriculture. Till now, out of the 33 countries, often only seven countries fulfilled that promise. So we ask the African leaders, when a child or a person die out of famine, who is responsible, Mr. President? Their blood in your hands. So we must take issue with, with our leaders before anybody else. So that is the issue of agriculture and how uh, uh, we need to focus really and, and developing that sector very quickly because we should be able to feed the whole world, not only our people. The third issue is climate change because Africa has been devastated by climate change. We did not put that carbon up there. Somebody else did that. Yet we are really suffering the most effect, uh, uh, the worst effect of that. We need to be ready for that. And we need to have really the real green revolution to start in Africa. That's where we can really have uh, an interesting uh, 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 really future into the green industries. What's important now really in Africa is the rise of the civil society. That is the true guardian 
the civil society. And I'm very proud that the mobile phone played a very important role in really tying Africa together, enabling the freedom of flow uh, of information. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we, the African civil society, are holding our governments accountable. I hope you and other people also held their governments and their multinationals also accountable because governance is indivisible. And when we talk uh, about corruption, for example, uh, we need to understand who is corrupting who exactly. We are looking after our people and looking carefully at them. What about your business people? What are they doing? Europe did not pass a law, anti-corruption law, until, 19, until the 2000s, under pressure from ACAD. Until nine years ago, corruption was legal in Europe. Actually, you have incentives because it's tax deductible. <laughs> this is the guys lecturing us from the soapbox. Corruption was legal. It made it legal. How many cases have been brought to trials? In all of Europe, maybe four or five cases. Some countries never had any cases. And we say, is that reasonable? Is our officials corrupting themselves? Who, who's corrupting, so who's paying? So that's an issue we really deal with. Wall watched with horror what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. And we noticed the great anger of the American president and the American media at what BP is committed, has committed in the Gulf of Mexico. But sometimes you sit back and wonder, where is that indignation when their companies came and did what they did and continue to do in Nigeria? Having they heard of the Delta in Nigeria, what Chevron, what Shell, did in a, they destroyed the environment and still destroying it. I haven't seen Obama calling for $20 billion fund to restore or to, to mitigate this. Or to, I'm saying justice cannot, is indivisible. Can, we cannot talk with forked tongues. We cannot act, you know, pretend there is two, two standards of way of action. Either we have rule of law everywhere, either we have good governance everywhere, or, or, or we better shut up. That, I think, is very important. So we Africans doing our things, but we expect other people also uh, to do the right thing. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. You know, when I grow up, I want to be a billionaire. <laughs> so I can stand up and say whatever I want. <laughs> when I grow up, I, I, really, I really want to be a dean of, of, of a faculty, actually. <laughs> so maybe okay, we should change seats. We'll change seats. <laughs> Well, Mo, that was a very, uh, a very good talk. And I, and I know that many in the audience have many good questions to ask you. But I'm going to be very honest and ask you the, 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 uh, the absolutely number one Singapore question, OK? The number one Singapore question is, is, is how do you set up a company for 50000 and set it for $900 million? <laughs> Before we get to the serious business of government. <laughs> Uh, I think with hard work. Hard work. <laughs> a little bit of know-how and uh, a bit of hard work. Mm. And uh, what I found also, I mean, I, I, I was never meant to be a businessman. I mean, I started the company because I fed up with British Telecom. It was yeah. a huge bureaucracy. And, uh, mm. I got fed up with that. And so I resigned. 
And when you resign, what you do, you go home and tell your wife, okay, I'm gonna be a consultant. Mm. <laughs> what else you do? <laughs> so you take over the dining room and you say, that's my office, dining <laughs> table. And you put fax machine, at that time there's no internet yet. Mm. We have a fax machine there and the telephone say, I'm a, I'm a consultant. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I have no idea. Uh, 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 about how to do business or so. But I think that's why I succeeded. Uh, because I think the, 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 the problem with, 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 you know, if it was some entrepreneur or business people is that if you don't know, yeah. you better say, I don't know. Yeah. And so I didn't know how to do business. So I say, I don't know. I don't know how to read a business plan. I don't know how. Uh, 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 to read the budget, I, I, so I ask. I always ask. I never feel so. How we do this? And I found later on, just is really all what you need is common sense, and you own. You say I don't know. The problem I found with later on is many of my managers. When I have a manager who doesn't know, but he's too ashamed to say I don't know, then you go and make a really bad mistake <laughs> because they really uh, too ashamed to say I don't know. So I think don't, not knowing is a great uh, asset, actually. So the answer in life is, say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think they're going to move your mic a bit. Yeah. 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 But you seek knowledge. Yeah. That's yes. important. You don't stay ignorant. That's right. You seek knowledge. True. And you know, just before I go to the floor, one more question. You know, you're, I'm, I was very impressed by how you publicized the results of the index of good governance in all the newspapers, in all the local languages, in, in all the African states. So by now, you must have a, a good feel of what was the impact of doing that in terms of improving governance. Can you tell us some stories of how publication of the index led to better governance? Right, I mean, I mean, whenever I meet an African president now, the first thing he, he always complains. Everybody complains. Huh. Why, why, why you are number thirty-five in your index? <laughs> we are much better than that. More. Why you? So, to start with, people care. You know, I yeah. mean, governments care. Yeah. Uh, of course, nobody is happy with yeah. them except with Mauritius because they are number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only country which is happy. And that's but like Singapore. Everybody Singapore, else. Singapore is number one too, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I'm joking. Uh, well, I mean, you probably, if you include it in any, but we do it only for Africa. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, it, sh it shows how people uh, uh, care about this. Before we announce the result of the, the Bryce Committee, actually, I'm not a member. I hope that's clear. I'm not a member of the Bryce Committee. So I have no hand in choosing or, or anything because that would be bad governance. Uh, <laughs> but I'm the person also take the flick because yeah. I'm the face of the organization. So if anybody's unhappy, they have a go at me. Yeah. And they do. You know, the people who didn't win or the yeah. other people, oh, why do I, our demand did not win? Why are you guys doing this? So people really care. There's a lot of speculation in newspapers yeah. before uh, uh, before the prize, and some papers claim the, the result has been leaked, and they know what happened, which is impossible actually, yeah. because I don't know myself but yeah. the, until the, the day. Uh, so there is a great interest in, 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 yeah. in what's happening. We receive uh, a lot of mails. We, we travel a lot around Africa yeah. because we focus on university campuses, yeah. because that, this is the future of Africa. Yeah. We do radio talks, we do universities, we do, mm -hmm. and people are engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's wonderful. So, so, so it has to work, it has to work. It, it's moving, it's yeah. moving. Yeah. There's no magic wand. We can change the whole continent overnight. Yeah. It is our efforts and uh, yeah. Obi's effort. This, uh, it's a lot mm -hmm. of efforts of many good people yeah. who together, we, we, we're gonna yeah. change things over time. Great. So now we have the floor open. Can you please stand up? Uh, we have about 30 minutes or so for question and answer. Uh, please identify yourself briefly, and if you don't mind, a short, sharp question. Sure. Good evening, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. My name is Louis Maisel. I'm Deputy Chief of Mission at the American Embassy here in Singapore. Just arrived, <laughs> just arrived. Um, I served, I've actually served most of my career in Africa. In fact, I've done more tours in Africa 
than anybody except uh, Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson, who you yeah. met with, I think, recently. I know very well Carson, yes, he's a friend of mine, yeah. On the issue of governance and providing opportunity for Africans, that was highlighted in President Obama's speech last year in Accra. Yes. How do African leaders deal with the issue of demographics? Right now, over 40% of Africans are under the age of 16 yes. in Sub-Saharan Africa. By the year 2050, the population of Africa will double, and, and over 60% of Africans will be under the age of 18. Yeah. How do African leaders deal with this demographic, demographic bulge and create opportunities for young Africans so that young Africans won't have to flee to Europe through the Sahel, flee to the Canary Islands through Mauritania, try to win the diversity visa lottery to go to the United States, or join armed groups or rebel groups and do other types of things that young Africans do when, there were, when there's no opportunity. Thank you very much. But I hope first you confirm my story about the American ambassador. It, it was true, correct? <laughs> I wasn't posted there at that time. <laughs> you are, you He's going to give a diplomatic answer. A true diplomat. <laughs> a true diplomat. No, uh, but admittedly, the United States have changed a lot, and uh, there's no, no question about, it, uh, uh, about that. Uh, uh, the, there's two ways to look at the issue of the bulge of the young generation in, in Africa. Africa has the highest proportion of the world of young population. My personal view of this is that it's going to be a great asset for Africa in the future. And I'll tell you why. You cannot look at Africa in isolation. I live in Europe. Europe is an aging, dying community, actually. And Europe is 30 years is going to have a massive problem. The first person who introduced pensions was Bismarck. Pension, the, pension. Uh, the Bismarck. pensions. Bismarck. Yes. It's Bismarck. Yeah. And at that time, the average uh, uh, span of life was 46 years old. OK? So those lucky two guys in a thousand who lived to be 60 years. And that was wonder, you know, great, fair enough, we can deal with that. Yeah. Now, span of life, I mean, the, 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 the life spans are extended, the people now say 85, 84, 88, I don't know, and increasing. The cost of, of keeping people healthy, whether they are 70 or 80 or 90, are really increasing exponentially with age. All these wonderful new devices and new things. Theoretically, can you be, science can keep you alive maybe forever. They kept Sharon in Israel how many years? And he's still alive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we going to do? In the past, I think every seven workers supported, supported two pensioners. Yeah. I think now we're moving to every two workers supporting seven pensioners. <laughs> how are they going to do that? And that's why when I talk to Europeans and say, you know what, guys, if you are smart and you are not smart, unfortunately, that they only share term. <laughs> you look at short term. I will spend money in education in Africa because that's your future workforce. Mm. This, those young African kids who are dying on these illegal uh, 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 tiny boats trying to cross, it, cross the water to Europe, I said, tomorrow we're going to send your executive jets to bring them here with the red carpet because this is the guys who will come, do the work, and pay and support your aging population. So we need to look at demographics in that uh, context. Also, as the standard of life, level, uh, of life start increasing, uh, people tend to have less children. So things tend to sort itself somehow in... in, in uh, in that direction. So a lot depends on us, Africa now, how we're gonna train and educate those young people. If we manage to train and educate those people, that would be a great asset for the future. We, we're gonna sell those guys very expensively to you guys. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Thanks. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, Mirad Shuda, I'm on the executive committee of One Singapore, which is the chapter for Millennium Development Goal in this country. 
Uh, very interesting uh, to hear your insight of your experiences with the Millennium Development Goal and good governance. I would like to ask you whether you think that uh, since the Glen Eagles uh, Summit, whether the, the G8 has actually failed in its part to fulfill its uh, obligations, and or do you think that the beneficiaries have also failed to live up to their expectations of good governance to receive those funds for $15 billion? Uh, sorry, I missed the no, last part. The question about the G8 and their failure to fulfill the promises that they made to Africa. You know, at the famous know, yeah. 2005 summit, uh, Tony Blair was there. They yeah. made these huge promises to Africa. They haven't delivered. So the question is what happens, right? I, I, well, I, I, let me express my, my personal view about this. This is my personal view, please. So, yeah. It's not the foundation or anybody else. Yeah. I'm always reprimanded. Yeah, you, you're, you're speaking off the record in your personal capacity. Absolutely. On the record in your personal capacity. <laughs> <laughs> I really have no faith in all those guys, okay? I, I, I pay no attention to G8, G7, G20, G25, whatever they call it, <laughs> okay? Africa internal resources, our own budgetary, you know, total is over five, it was that six, $600 billion, okay? All those guys talk about 30, 40 billion dollars. That's six, five percent of what we are generating. Mm. I, I really look, for us to use our $600 billion, our own money, in an efficient way, then we don't need this $40 billion to go to hell. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in those guys. Those guys have, well, I have my views about their, their characters. Or, or, or. <laughs> we, ha we heard so many promises, so many stuff, and, and, and uh, I, I don't pay attention to that. We have to rely ourselves on Africa. Okay, we have to do the work ourselves. We have the resources. We don't need that money. And I look forward for the day when we join this, whatever they call it at that time, and we offer aid to those guys one day. <laughs> and, it will, and it will happen. <laughs> That's a good answer. I think we're going to get a lady now, my colleague. Uh, Mo, do you want to move your microphone maybe onto your tie? You might, you might make it yeah. sound better. Okay. Put it onto the tie, yeah. Yeah, that's better, I think, yeah. That's fine, that's fine, I think. Is it okay now? Is you it try? okay like this? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. It's a little bit too emotional, I think that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Please identify yourself to a... Uh, we met earlier today. I'm Astrid Tamina's Assistant Dean and Director of Research at the Lee Kuan Yew School. In addition to the willingness and ability to say, I don't know, what would you say are the other foundational values or principles that have guided your journey as a successful and effective leader. Thank you. Uh, besides, besides, I, besides saying I don't know in response to questions, what are the other principles that guided you to effective leadership in your personal career? I, I, I think it was essential to uh, instill teamwork. 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 Yeah. Uh, in, my, in my first company, everybody in my company was a shareholder. I made everybody in the company shareholder. By the time we sold the company, $350 million of the $900 million went to our employees, 700 people. That includes everybody, even the cleaner. Mm. We're shareholder, they shared $350 million. Our next company, we sold for $3.4 billion. Our people had about 15% of that company. Five zero, 50%. 15, one, uh, one five. One, one five. 15% of, 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 of the company. So we created over 100 millionaires in this uh, uh, second company. And so because by sharing, by making everybody owner of the business, it changed the whole psychology of the workplace. You know, I don't need, I walk the corridor in the company, I don't need to go down and pick up a piece of paper to put it in the bag because people would have done it already. I don't need to check who comes when and when to where, etc. We need to do work during Christmas time, during New Year. People just do it because it's their business. It's their ownership. So I always believed in that uh, attitude to work. We work openly. Every month I have a, a town hall meeting. We have all the employees of the companies. And we have a meeting. And people can call me names, can say whatever they like. Nobody is fired for dissent. But once we are finished, we agreed a decision is finished. We all go in the same direction and we go and execute. That's it. There's no more discussion. Uh, that that was it's just common sense. 
and people respond uh, 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 to, to, this, uh, uh, to this sort of approach. Good. Next question. Yes, I see a hand up there and then a hand over here. Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, five. Wow. Hello. Hello. Um, okay, you have to keep moving at a rapid clip now. <laughs> yeah, can I yo? I'm now uh, attending the senior management program at Lee Kuan Yew School. Yeah. In the recently completed World Cup, I'm personally very impressed with South Africa for successfully uh, organizing the event. I want to just uh, ask your personal opinion. What is the longer term impact of this uh, successful event on Africa, uh, the people and the country? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think can it's, you put it, the mic closer? I think. Yeah, can it you, is. Can you I think, the back? Okay, I think it is uh, very important for the African moral self-confidence. This, this is the thing we need to restrain in self-confidence. And we, we are capable of doing anything. I mean, when South Africa was playing uh, 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 France, yeah. South Africa played France, I had a problem because I didn't know who's, which team to support because both were Africans. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> It's true. You know this? Nine players in France was, were, 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 were Africans, and South African teams have two or three white players, so it was equal. So I really didn't know. So we, we need to really have self confidence. What the Cup in South Africa gave us is yes, we can organize things, we can, things can work. There's no problem. I was in Cape Town. Unfortunately, I didn't attend the match. I was working as usual, but I, I, it was great. Wonderful atmosphere. Amazing atmosphere in, in the town. No crimes, no violence. People having fun. Transport is working. Beautiful stadiums. So we can, we can get things done like anybody else. I mean, what we, so that is important for people's self-confidence. We can do things. And sometimes we can do things better than other people. Look at mobile phones. They look at money transfers by mobile phone. The, what the cradle of this is in Africa. We have the most advanced money transfer systems by mobile phones in Africa. Hmm. Not in America, not in Europe, not in Singapore even. True. It, really, it is in Africa. We have millions and millions of daily transactions on mobile phones. It's wonderful. So we can find our way and we can get things done. And that's important. We need that self-confidence. Mm. Gentlemen in front here. Yeah. Dr. Mo. Thank you. Dr. Mo, a pleasure to hear you today. Uh, my name is Ranveer and I work for Olam. My company has got significant operations in Africa and I'm responsible for quite a few of them. We work in the field of agriculture commodities, cocoa, coffee, etc. My question will be about governance in West Africa. I have heard a lot of your work and the foundation's work in South and East Africa. How strongly does the foundation focus on West Africa? And specifically, could you advise your views on the situation in Cote d'Ivoire? That's a tough question. I was in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, uh, I think two or three months ago, we had the annual meeting of the African Development Bank in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, things are getting more peaceful now, and we think we reached a situation uh, where the country go back to normality. It is a very sad story because Cote d'Ivoire, was, was or the Ivory Coast in English, was was a successful African country, and unfortunately. Uh, this problem happened between North and South. The African Development Bank took a decision to move back to Abidjan, which was a, a, big, uh, a good indication of the return of peace and harmony. Uh, we, we work in uh, West Africa. I mean, it's, uh, me, I'm, I don't speak French. It is a problem. But uh, uh, quite a number of our people, our foundation, the French speak. It is not an issue. All our documents are in our website in all African uh, principal languages. So they are in French, are in Portuguese. Are in so we're communicating with, those, uh, with people in those Africa. Actually, 
people like Yusi Nadur and uh, Angelique Kejo and uh, those guys do all our concerts. And uh, so we, we work everywhere uh, 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 in Africa, including uh, West Africa. I've been to Senegal a few times. Uh, Ghana, I've been to Ghana a few times also. Because Ghana also was Africa, although it is, uh, is not Francophone, it is Anglophone. I hear this word, Francophone and Anglophone, and we need to get rid of all this stuff and just say Africans, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. I, I see lots of hands. Can I suggest that the four of you come to the four mics and maybe we take four questions, please? Come to the mics, those who have questions, we take four at the same time. One, one in front here? Yeah. Yes, please. This is my guru, Yatiman, please. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kiso. Uh, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, listening to your speech yesterday and today, I have no doubt that you are the best person who have your mind, your feet, and your hands in most of the African countries. There has been a perception here that uh, within Africa, you have Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya, from the West, South, and East Africa, and some would identify Egypt for Northern Africa, as the potential engine of growth. What is your assessment in the process of integrating Africa on the roles that Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya has to play in increasing the tempo of progress and development? Can I, can I suggest more to, you know, since you to take, take four questions, you can, you can take notes. Uh, the first one is about the, the big countries in Africa. So we take, take three more questions and then we can, yeah. Please go ahead. Identify yourself and your my question, name, please. My name is Arlie Smoot. I'm a student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Mm. Uh, my question goes back to the West. Uh, you mentioned that aid isn't something that you feel is necessary. Speak louder, please, yeah. You, you said that aid isn't something you feel is necessary for Africa. I was wondering what, if anything, the West can or should be doing, public or private, to help develop Africa. Yeah. Question of aid, yeah. Okay. Good. Next question, please. Hello. My name is uh, Maeko, and I'm uh, from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, please please tell more which country you're from. Senegal. Senegal. We have a student from Senegal. <laughs> uh, I have listened to your speech uh, yesterday and today, and um, I mean, a lot of great words were spoken uh, by you, by uh, Obiageli, and by a lot of people. Um, and uh, I would like to know uh, how can we ensure that it's not, it's not just words word spoken in terms of uh, what can Africa learn from uh, Singapore in, in terms of creating a uh, a structure that would make sure that FDIs, for example, uh, are, are, are coming to Africa, because we all know that uh, FDIs is a big problem, attracting FDIs is a big problem for the African continent. So how, what advice would you give someone wanting to um, cre create, for example, a foundation to facilitate uh, relations between Asia and Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then the fourth one, then we give more chance to reply. Um, good evening, I'm uh, Isa al uh, from Qatar, and uh, I'm a candidate in the Lee Kuan Yew University's uh, senior management program. Um, I've noticed that in, within two questions that were addressed uh, to you is that challenges were presented to you. One of them was the young uh, age of uh, Africans, and the other one was the G20 and the disappointment. But uh, your response to them was actually changed into an optimism and as an opportunity rather than a challenge. So for a leader uh, like your kind self, how would you manage to change the mindset of people like the way that you are? As Arabs, we believe that God doesn't change people's situation unless they change theirs, themselves from the inside. So as a leader, how would you manage to change the people's mindset <coughs> to the optimistic picture that you're hiding yourself. Thank you. Okay, you, you, I think you've got the four questions. First one about Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and maybe Egypt. Second question on Western aid and what can Western aid do. Third question about what can Africa learn from Singapore, FDI, Asian-African relations. And the fourth one, how do you change uh, people's mindset? Yes, yes. Uh, very quickly, uh, you are correct about the edges of growth. 
Maybe you should add Morocco, maybe you should add Algeria. These are also perfect countries. Angola is coming strong. Ghana, watch out Ghana. Mona uh, can, can really move uh, very quickly. A country I like also is Mozambique, but Mozambique needs to do a little bit of infrastructure, but they have a good uh, route forward. There are going to be a number of tigers really coming out uh, of, of, of Africa. Uh, about the issue of aid, uh, etc. Please, uh, I'm not against aid. I'm not. Uh, uh, some of my best friends, uh, the chief executive of Oxfam and uh, Yasmin of, of, of Save the Children, and Bono is a very good friend of mine, of one. So I have no issue who with do you, who, do you, who do you not know, by the way? Huh? Who do you not know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 it's really, we have no, there's no, uh, 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 anybody give a, a dime to Africa, I say thank you very much, and I'm very grateful. But what, this is a message to my own people. When I speak to my African people, we don't need to rely on other people's generosity. Can we first rely on ourselves? If we have a problem, yes, people will come and help you because as human beings, we help each other in time of need. But let us first, first do our work. Then we are worthy even of the aid we're getting from people. But I don't want our people to just sit back in the sun with a big ball waiting for uh, a generous Western to come and give us aid. That's not fair. It's not, we have our pride, and this is damaging to our pride and, and, and self-respect. So that's my position uh, on that. But uh, giving the message, and uh, I did a tour with Bono, actually, of all the people, a number of people in, in uh, this is the, some activists, American activists, some Irish activists, a group called One. I don't know if you're familiar with them and a group called Red. Uh, so we, we travel, there's all celebrities, all fashion uh, models, those actresses, or, you know, all, all those kind of people, anyway. But you, you're one of them too, you know? I, I don't know <laughs> them, actually. You know, for, for sure, I'm so boring. I don't, I don't know, it's been so, oh, this is a great actress, or this, I say, oh, hi, okay. But, <laughs> but uh, I know one of them, because he's a friend, uh, but, what we done, uh, of course, they were, they were visiting their projects, and I was doing our political stuff. We go to universities to address students. We have a town hall meetings. Uh, we have a thousand students or so. We have this kind, of, like we're having kind of discussion we're having today, today, but only it is very, very hot and tough because those guys are young people, and they really, uh, and Bono and those guys came to, to this meeting. And at the end, he said, you know what? This is a total revelation to me. Nobody, nobody of those people is asked about it. Or what is, no, all people talking about how we're going to improve our system of government. How we're going to take this country forward. What we need to do. What we are doing wrong. Nobody is caring our, about the promises of Tony Blair or Brown or whoever. We don't care about, no, none of the students are asking about that. They're focusing on their own leadership and their duties as said that. And I said, that's the point, Pono, because those guys are not beggars. Those guys are not beggars, they just need to. So the message is already there. The message, no African guy is there waiting for, for, for people to come and feed them. We shouldn't depend on that. But if we have a disaster, people came to help in the Darfur or some way, of course we say thank you, thank you very much. And uh, that's uh, humanity, uh, uh, after all. The third question about Africa and Asia and Singapore and FDI. What? So, I, many times I quote actually Singapore to my friends in Africa. Because, t to be honest, I mean, the, the old odds was against you guys here in Singapore. I mean, this was a, a little village nowhere. Mm. I heard you had a lot of malaria and mm. tough stuff here. And you, you were starving. Yeah. Actually, I discovered by chance that when somebody phones you, Kishu, yeah. what you don't say hello. You yeah. say, "Have you eaten?" Yeah. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, <it's right. laughs> Who on earth answered the phone by saying, "Have you eaten?" 
except people who have been through starvation. Correct? They, they say, they say locally, sudah makan. Yeah, uh, sudah makan. <laughs> have you eaten? Uh, this is true, yeah. So I, I say to, to, I said, look at those, look at those people. You know, they had this little piece of land, they had famine, they cannot eat, they this and this. And now, look what, what they have done today. You go to Singapore, it's more advanced than, than Manhattan. Yeah. You know, how come people did this? They did it simply by rule of law, clean governance, transparency. That is very essential. Without, when I built my first company, the, the one we're talking about, our headquarter in Asia, we had business, we had companies in Shanghai, we had a company in Hong Kong, we had one in Malaysia, we had one in, in Australia, we had one in, but our headquarter was in Singapore. Why in Singapore? Our business in Singapore was very little. We had few customers here, maybe we had income of one million a year, but our income from Asia was like 40, 50 million dollars a year. So that was the smallest income we had from here, but our headquarters was still was here. Why? Because there is transparency, there is rule of law. I know exactly what is tomorrow for me, what the business. This is a friendly environment for business, a fair and clear society. You win. So it's not, it's not difficult. Just put a transparent and clean society for people, apply rule of law, and that's all what you want to do. One thing I like here about Singapore, which you, you may not, some of you may not like, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Actually, it's a bit, I like the way you pay your ministers and senior civil servants. <laughs> <laughs> because we have a major problem with that issue. When a minister in Africa is paid $500 a month, which is not enough to pay for his school fees for his kids. Mm. And this guy is supposed to go and sign $500 million contract with an oil company. Is that a fair situation really to put any person through this? When Mohammed El Fayed in London gave envelopes of 5,000 pounds to a British MP to ask a certain question, or when some MPs falsify, uh, forge, their expenses in London. What that, that, what that does to the body politics. When our kids in London, and I say our because I'm also British citizen. When our kids in London asked, when people asked who the people really popular and who are the people you don't trust. You know, the, the second car, second hand, car salesman and the politicians. <laughs> this is the bottom. When, what kind of civilization which thinks that their politicians are thieves and liars? What is the future? And you know why? Because the MP is paid peanuts. Mm. The minister in London is paid 84,000 pounds is less than my PA. My PA gets paid more than that. <laughs> Honestly, I, I swear, my PA gets paid more than that. That is the minister. Uh, what, 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 this is nonsense. And that's an issue that needs to be dealt if you want to get the best brains, the best people in government to ensure that. Because otherwise, the most stupid people will go into government because they cannot work anywhere else. And that destroys, really. Who would do that? Either to do that or to go and be a thief, you steal. So both outcomes are undesirable. We need to have the courage to face uh, uh, really this issue. It's so important, Kisho. Yeah. And I don't know what genius led you guys here in Singapore yeah. to solve this problem. Yeah. Look at Japan, how corrupt are the MPs in Japan? Yeah. And yeah. what that does to governance? These issues, people need to speak about it. But anyway, I'm an African, it's not my issue. <laughs> last, last question was about how do you change the mindset of uh, people? You know, the, the young man from Qatar who asked the question, 
you know, about how I, you change the mind. I don't need to change it. As I, I told you about those kids, when we, we go with Bono and, and, and those by people get wild. I mean, this is a very civilized, nice evening. Those guys are jumping. We cannot give the, you know, the mics and all over the place. People are really angry. They want to change the society and they want to change it themselves. They're not looking for anybody come from abroad to tell them how to change it or what to do it. Af young African people understand that it is in their hands and you need to do something about it. Look at what happened in Zimbabwe and in Kenya. I think it was wonderful. It was wonderful what happened in Zimbabwe and what happened in Kenya. When people queued from five o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning to vote, and then they discover their votes would not respect it. Those guys did not take it lying down, did not. And that is really wonderful. I, I was so happy to see really people say, we are not taking it anymore. That's great. This is a new Africa coming up. In the past, it would have been business as usual. You know? Don't forget, you know, in the past, Mugabe did it and he went to Buckingham Palace and been entertained by the Queen and he got some medals and got this and got that. It's business as usual. Now, no, it's not business as usual. And that's how Africa is changing. Well, I must say, uh, Mo, you've given us a lot of hope. I began by saying my, my introductory remarks that governance is back and uh, you can see clearly as a result of governance coming back, frankly, schools of public policy like ours are going to become a sunrise, sunrise industry, and therefore we are in the right business at the right time. But the <laughs> other business, I must say, that you are also in the right business at the right time is that another sunrise industry that's developing in the world, which is a very interesting sunrise industry, is that the billionaires in the world are beginning to realize that when you become a billionaire, you don't buy your next yacht, your next jet. You actually try to use your fortune to improve society. And as you know, uh, others have joined you. Uh, Bill Gates is doing it. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett held a meeting in the United States of America to try and persuade all the billionaires in America to come together and to do good for society. And I must say, you yourself, Mo, really are becoming a fantastic role model for people not just in Africa, but all over the world, because now we need a Mo Ibrahim Index for Asia, too. <laughs> I think what we need is Kisho Index for Asia. <laughs> because I'm not joking. Uh, it, is, it is your job, Kisho, to do, to do Asia. I'm, I'm doing Africa, you do Asia. <laughs> and, uh, Thank I, you. Thank I, you very I, much, Mo. I, I, I'm now going to set up a company for $50,000. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. You made it a very special occasion. Please join me in thanking Mo. <laughs>